welcome, travelers. This is the Baseball Time Machine. Today's journey takes us back out west to Los Angeles. In 1981, a young pitcher named Fernando Valenzuela burst onto the scene, taking the baseball world by storm. Fernando Mania ran wild through Chavez Ravine, grabbing the love and admiration of the heavily Hispanic area. Fast forward a decade later, and it had all fallen apart. What happened? Let's step into the portal and find out. Before Fernando Mania, Valenzuela's baseball life began in his native Mexico at the young age of 17. He joined the Guanajuato Tutsos, going 5-6 and six with a very solid 2-2-3 ERA. He spent his age 18 season with the Yucatan Lions before being sold to the Los Angeles Dodgers. He spent most of the 1980s season with AA San Antonio, winning 13 games and pitching to a 3-10 ERA. An injury on the big league level opened up a roster spot. Fernando got the call, and the 19-year-old was on his way to Chavez Ravine. He couldn't have made a better impression, not giving up a single earned run in 10 relief appearances. The baseball world had been introduced to El Toro, but this was just the beginning. 1981, Fernando Valenzuela's first full big league season and the birth of Fernando Mania. Now a staple of the Dodgers rotation, Fernando had the opportunity to really show what he could do, and show he did. Originally slated to be the team's third man in the rotation, Valenzuela was named opening day starter after an injury to Jerry Royce. He kicked off the season in spectacular fashion with a five-hit shutout against Houston. In his first eight career starts, he went 8-0 with seven complete games, five shutouts, and an ERA well under one. He allowed just four runs in his first 72 innings pitch. This is an eight-game span that you rarely see, a kind of dominance that time travelers go back to look at. El Toro had reached superstar. There was something magical about watching Fernando Valenzuela pitch, the seemingly unlimited stamina, the screwball, the way he'd look to the heavens in every windup, appearing to pull the powers from above into every pitch. When El Toro was on the bump, all eyes were on him. Fans flocked to the stadium every fifth day to witness the greatness that was Fernando Mania. Over 50,000 showed up to opening day to watch Valenzuela shut out the Astros. In his eighth start of the season, over 53,000 watched him throw a complete game against the Expos on a Thursday. But it wasn't just Chavez Ravine that would be packed to the brim for El Toro. On May 3rd, over 46,000 piled in the State Olympique in Montreal. Five days later, Valenzuela brought over 39,000 to Shea Stadium. Neither ballpark had great attendance numbers that year, but people pulled up for El Toro. In almost every start, home or away, Stadium saw significant attendance increases with Fernando on the bump. He finished the season with a 13-7 record, holding a 2-4-8 ERA and leading MLB in strikeouts. There's a chance that his numbers would have been even better, if not for a 50-day player strike that ran through most of June and all of July. Fernando wasn't just a star athlete, but a full-on celebrity. He was the best and most popular Dodgers pitcher since the great Sandy Koufax graced the mound over a decade prior. This, his age 20 season, couldn't have been more rewarding. He started in his first All-Star game, won his first Silver Slugger award, and became the first and only pitcher in Major League history to win both the Rookie of the Year and Cy Young awards in the same season. On top of that, Fernando and the Dodgers won the World Series, defeating the New York Yankees in six games. Valenzuela threw a complete game in LA's 5-4 victory over the Bronx Bombers in Game 3. One big key to El Toro's dominance was his screwball. The screwball has always been a rare pitch, one that made him effective against both righties and lefties. Made famous by pitchers like Carl Hubble and Christy Mathewson, Valenzuela was just about the only pitcher throwing it around 1981. Hubble, who retired in 1943, showed Fernando some love when asked about the pitch he made so deadly. Even once hitters got comfortable seeing his screwball, it remained effective. Now that he had established himself, it was time for Valenzuela to really get to work. He became the Dodgers' workhorse, leading the team in innings pitched each year over the next five seasons. He was always towards the top of the league when it came to complete games, including a 1986 season in which he led MLB with 20. He was an all-star in all five of those seasons, keeping form as one of baseball's best arms. In 1986, in what would be his last Midsummer Classic appearance, Valenzuela tied fellow screwballer Carl Hubble's record by striking out five consecutive batters. He capped off that 1986 season by winning an NL Best 21 games. Unfortunately, this would be one of the final highlights of his career. After five consecutive seasons throwing over 250 innings, Fernando's iron arm started to show signs of overuse. As a result, his performance took a hit. 1987 wasn't a bad year per se, but was the worst year of his career to that point. He went 14 and 14 with a 3.98 ERA, experiencing a significant decrease in strikeouts. He led the NL with 12 complete games, but also led the league in hits and walks allowed. The issue carried over into the next few seasons. 
He struggled through 1988, only tossing 142 innings and having an ERA over 4 for the first time in his career. LA celebrated another World Series victory in 1988, but Valenzuela played no part. Due to his loss of form, Fernando wasn't used at all in the postseason. New ace Oral Hershiser and the Dodgers handled the A's with ease, defeating them in five games. El Toro continued to labor into 1989, carrying what turned out to be a streak of 19 consecutive starts without a victory. It's the longest such streak from a former Cy Young Award winner. Slowly but surely, the Dodgers began to lose patience. His last highlight in Dodger Blue came on June 29, 1990, when he no-hit the St. Louis Cardinals. This made him the first Mexican-born player to achieve such a feat. Despite the no-hitter, Fernando struggled again. 1990 was another tough year, one that marked his last in Los Angeles. He failed to make it out of camp in 1991, going 1-2 with a 7-8-8 ERA in spring training, and was placed on waivers. Sure, his best fastball had barely touched 85 miles per hour over the last few years, but no one saw things actually coming to an end. It was a tough decision for the front office, and even the players were shocked to hear that the once iconic Fernando Valenzuela couldn't break camp. The light that Fernando Mania shined on the team and the city had completely faded. Valenzuela's star had burnt out. The shell of a once captivating pitcher now remained, and stood hurt, tired, and thrown away by the franchise that gave him fame. All of this, and he was still only 29 years old. Opportunity would come his way not long after, as the California Angels gave him a chance two months later. Unfortunately, he played some of his worst baseball in Anaheim. He only started two games for the Halos, allowing nine earned runs in six and two-thirds innings, and was released by the end of the season. Valenzuela had hit rock bottom. Bitter from his release, and embarrassed from his performance with the Angels, questions rolled in as to whether El Toro had thrown his final pitch in the big leagues. But the story isn't over just yet. Despite being picked up by the Detroit Tigers, his contract was purchased by Charles de Jalisco of the Mexican League. He wouldn't see MLB action in 1992, but maybe returning to his home country would serve as a career reset and spark a resurgence in the former Cy Young Award winner. He wound up going 10-9 with a 3.86 ERA in his homecoming. Not necessarily ace level, but definitely respectable. The year abroad earned him another MLB contract, this time with the Baltimore Orioles. He wasn't great, going 8-10 with an ERA near 5. It was clear by this point that there would be no sequel to Fernando Mania. Fernando took another trip to Mexico in 1994, going 10-3 with the Charros, displaying some of his best pitching in years. Like in the past, it earned him a ticket back to Major League Baseball, with the Phillies giving him a chance to turn things around. Signed in late June, El Toro was used sparingly in the remaining few months of the season. Valenzuela had earned himself a few more years in the big leagues. Outside of a resurge in 1996, in which he won 13 games for the Padres, these last three seasons were far from noteworthy. The highlight of his time with San Diego, and maybe his final big moment, came on August 16, 1996. Fernando and the Pods took on the Mets in El Toro's native Mexico. A hero to Mexicans everywhere, Fernando threw out the ceremonial first pitch. Born in Navoja, just 800 miles from the game in Monterrey, it was a special day for El Toro and Mexican natives alike. It marked the first time MLB made the trip to Mexico. Valenzuela tossed six strong to earn the win, much to the satisfaction of the sold out crowd. His MLB career would end on a sour note, going 2-12 with an ERA near 5 for the Padres and Cardinals in 1997. Only a month after being traded to St. Louis, Fernando was released. This would be the dagger, officially ending a chapter of his career that was turbulent, to say the least. Valenzuela's inconsistency was validated years later, as he fell off the ballot of the National Baseball Hall of Fame after only two years. Although Cooperstown wasn't in the cards, Fernando Valenzuela was inducted into the Latin Baseball and Caribbean Baseball Halls of Fame. There's no question that Fernando Valenzuela was and still is loved by many, especially Dodgers fans. One of the greatest honors that can be bestowed on a player is having a franchise retire their jersey number. At Dodgers Fan Fest in February 2023, the team announced that no Dodgers player would ever wear Fernando Valenzuela's iconic number 34 again. His number would officially be retired in August as part of a three-day Fernando Mania celebration. The smile on El Toro's face says it all. A much-deserved honor for someone that had such a special relationship with the fan base. It's extremely tough to make it as a professional athlete. There's a lot that has to go right to find success on the highest level. Fernando Valenzuela made an instant impact as a young 19-year-old, and was the ace of one of baseball's most prestigious franchises for years. Had the Dodgers limited his usage, would he have had more longevity? Most likely, yes. But without the look towards the sky, without the screwball, without the vast use, without the toll taken on his iron arm, would we have Fernando Mania? Hard to say that we would. 
Paraphrasing the powerful words of longtime Dodgers broadcaster, the late great Vin Scully, Fernando Mania was a religious experience and something we may never see again. This has been the Baseball Time Machine. Thanks for traveling. We here at Baseball Time Machine appreciate you spending time with us. To celebrate our recent journey, crack these codes for a chance to win a mystery artifact. Safe travels!